I was here um, uh, in May to give another whip, um, and uh, this is going to be kind of I'm what I'm hoping is a series of talks on the same subject of uh, OpenMRS and uh, the new application framework, um, and also some of the back end stuff that we're doing to move that project along. So today I, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, what I spoke about last time, just for those who may not have not been there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about who uses OpenMRS because it kind of sets the stage for the decisions that we've been making. Uh, and then uh, go over some of the architecture that we've decided so far, uh, talk a little bit about uh, our design-driven process, and then some of our future plans. Um, so this is kind of a typical uh, looking clinic in uh, Kenya uh, in Eldoret. Um, so I work for Ampath, as Burke mentioned. Um, I'm not going to go into kind of the history of Ampath uh, since I, I, I spoke quite a bit about that last time. Um, but this is uh, where a clinician sits. And you'll see on the table uh, a number of uh, books, their, their registers. And this is essentially how um, most uh, Ministry of Health facilities in Kenya, um, as well as other uh, many other countries in Africa, take um, notes about patients. So one big book, every patient goes in there. Um, not very easy to use. Uh, and if somebody decides that you need to ask another question, another book comes out. And these books start to multiply and multiply. And before you know it, just to see a patient with no complaints for a chronic care HIV visit, you're filling out 10 different uh, books for uh, of data, of which nobody really is paying attention to anyway. Um, so uh, that was one reason for the birth of OpenMRS. Um, so going back to 2004, um, was to kind of ease this burden of clinicians um, and also to make it easier to uh, review data for uh, research and for monitoring purposes. Um, these are just two example forms that kind of came out of that process. These were written in a no longer existing tool called um, by Microsoft called InfoPath. Um, and essentially they're meant to kind of replicate what data is supposed to be collected for HIV at one of our facilities. Um, the workflow is that a clinician would fill out the form and then eventually it would go to a data entry facility to be entered. Um, but although that was very effective for collecting the data, we just ran into new problems. So we went from this to this. Um, so now we're actually using a lot more paper per person. Um, the charts are not that easy to look through. It's a bunch of loose papers. Uh, because we're not necessarily entering the data at the facilities that it's being used at, uh, or that, it, that the patient went to, um, it's possible for the patient to come back before the chart does. Um, obviously substandard care. Uh, and you just end up with lots and lots and lots of paper. So that uh, kind of led to the creation of what we couldn't come up with a better name, I think, as I mentioned last time, to POC, which is our AMPATH's uh, front end for OpenMRS. So this is a web application um, done using a JavaScript framework called uh, Angular. Um, and we built it to be a point of care system. And we moved from uh, providers filling out forms and moving them all over the country and getting them entered and moving them back to a, a clinician driven process. So uh, at least at all of our high volume facilities, um, providers, so that would be community health workers, nurses, uh, clinicians are going to be using m most of the time tablets. You'll see a Chromebook here, but uh, most of the time using tablets uh, as they're seeing patients to review a patient's history and enter, enter data. Um, a lot of logistics behind that. Uh, I will not go into how uh, all the infrastructure issues that came up, but that's basically how um, things are today. Now, we ran into um, or where we are, we started to run into problems uh, about a year and a half ago. You know, when we started, this was a question of, you know, what was really possible. And as we moved into this is possible and we need to scale this, we started having challenges with resources. So trying to have one organization building an entire EMR is not very feasible, uh, at least uh, for us. Um, now, the, the problem is that we chose a framework that nobody else chose. Um, we have a 
uh, data dictionary that uh, is somewhat shared, but has really branched from the standard um, that many others are using um, several years ago. So we, we can't really, we, we have no interoperability either on the front end side or on the back end side. Um, and this is all in the setting of um, our organizations telling us we need uh, not just HIV now, but we want to do oncology, we want to do chronic diseases like hypertension and uh, diabetes and more and more, more and more demand for services. Um, now, when I started uh, asking around to see, oh, maybe there's other organizations that we can collaborate with, um, you started to realize that, yes, there's AMPATH, and then there's the legacy OpenMRS, and then there's the reference application, and then there's Uganda EMR, and then there's Kenya EMR, and then this is a, a, a Partners in Health Implementation in Mexico, so EMR de Compañeros en Salud, uh, and then there's one in Haiti. Uh, and what kind of ended up happening over the past five years is that um, everybody built their own front end. Uh, and as a result, although there is some collaboration, for the most part, people diverged uh, on paths that made it very hard to share uh, work, especially on, uh, on the UI side of things. Um, and as I asked more questions, everybody was feeling the same pain as we were at AMPATH. Um, and earlier this year, this led to a conversation that Burke started on uh, our message board called Talk about an amazing future for OpenMRS. Now, we were all aware of the potential. You know, probably the hardest thing for a software project is to get users. Um, we have many users, but our product Fought, fell way behind where our users were. So we're in, in a somewhat fortunate position in that we don't have to break into the market, uh, but people are starting to get fed up and want to alter, want, want something new from, from OpenMRS. Um, now, uh, as Burke articulated, this isn't the first time that OpenMRS tried to do this. In 2014, we, we went under uh, kind of a similar process and built a, uh, a thing that's generally just called the reference application. Um, the problem is, is really we had bad luck. So right around that time, as OpenMRS was uh, developing a pretty bespoke way of adding modularity onto the front end of OpenMRS, um, the JavaScript world took off. Um, and uh, fortunately, we just guessed wrong. Uh, we chose technologies and standards that really ended up becoming somewhat deprecated and are generally not often used anymore today. However, all of our implementations are still based in that. Um, and so what a problem that, you know, potentially we could have solved it back then, although for all I know in five years, some other guy is going to be up here telling you the same story uh, about what I did wrong. Um, uh, you know, we have a new. We we have a need now to to try and address the situation. Um, oh, sorry, I, I did not see this. I forgot about the slide, but uh, you could just see what Burke Burke wrote. I'll give you ten seconds to read it. Um, all right. So going back to my whip from uh, May seventeenth. So one of my slides was this one. So um, we want to create a world class, open source, comprehensive EMR. Um, and it shouldn't just be for one vertical, um, but should be for uh, the entire health system. Um, now, this sounds great, um, but at the time, you know, we were all talk. Uh, and uh, for the most part, we're still working towards a, a lot of decisions, but we have begun the process of, of trying to recreate what we tend to call um, the application frame, a new application framework for OpenMRS. Um, so I'm gonna be, subsequently, I will, I will avoid further backgrounds moving forward in, uh, in my future whips and we'll probably be focusing more on the product that we're starting to create. Um, so a little bit about who OpenMRS implementers are. So, you know, we love to show this map. OpenMRS is used all over the world. Um, I think it's in more than 50 countries, uh, but you know, what does that mean? Is, is really every implementation the same? Even within a country, is everything the same? Um, so there's lots of variations across implementing organizations. You know, OpenMRS was originally built really to support the single clinic um, and uh, but things have changed, and uh, now many many implementations like Ampass are, are multi-clinic, um, single server versus multi-server. So 
mo for most of the for most implementers, they have a different computer in every single facility that serves as the EMR, which is a nightmare if you try and function as a single health system. Um, many places have no internet connect connectivity. Uh, some do. That changes a lot how you think about how to build your application. Um, are you allowed to move health data out of your country? Uh, does it have to stay on premise? Can you use uh, cloud resources uh, to host your servers or do you have to host your own data centers? Um, and then there's kind of the content areas as well. Not everybody's using it for the same types of care. Um, and then of course, size is, is very, you know, we, we will have people who write to the open MRS board saying, uh, I am starting, I have one clinic with, you know, 50 patients a month, I want to use open MRS to a, a place like Ampath, which has something like 100,000 patients, and we're all using the same system. So huge variations um, across who open MRS is. So in the midst of this uh, kind of all, all these different use cases, uh, I, I started working on a project with others to uh, build out this new application framework. So how do we do it? We don't have tons of money. Um, and we wanted we wanted to figure out how to do this uh, collaboratively. Okay, so you know collaboration is not easy. You want to at the heart everybody wants to be democratic and give everybody a say. Uh, on the other hand, that can be very slow, uh, and also it's often not fair because uh, not everybody's putting in the same amount of resources to the project. Um, so. Uh, Back in, I guess, around May, we started forming what we called a squad, and we essentially looked for all the largest stakeholders and asked them to commit a developer to this squad to, to build out this new system. Um, anybody was willing, but we just didn't want to have a situation where you got to provide advice, but you weren't uh, contributing uh, no, skin in the, no skin in the game. So uh, we ended up forming a squad, which we call the micro front end squad. I'm going to come back to what micro front ends means towards the ends of uh, the talk, but the squad included um, people from Ampath, Partners in Health, ThoughtWorks, um, Palladium, which is a large NGO operating in Kenya, and Makecom Solutions, a consulting company, um, and then University of Washington. Um, we identified a technical lead for our project who continues to lead it today. His name is Joel Denning. Um, and we came up with a process for how we were going to make decisions. Um, and uh, it's a, we used a request for comment method. I'm just going to show you briefly kind of what that looks like. Um, so we use GitHub. It's not the most user friendly, but uh, uh, it's the thing that we use. Um, and the idea behind an RFC is that you post a uh, an idea, you follow this pattern. So. Um, uh, sorry, this doesn't have the uh, template. Let me just sh show you that. Um, so basically, you define what it is, you design your reasons, you suggest alternatives, and you have some common practices that people could do that aren't going to be part of the RFC. Um, and we use this as a as a way of documenting uh, what the decisions that we made. And I'll show you quickly um, as so. It, you do, you do a pull request, means it's basically like a draft, and then as they're accepted, um, then we publish them. And so each one of these are decisions. Oh, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Hmm. Ah, sorry about that. Let's see. Now you should be seeing what I'm seeing. All right, there you go. So there's all the uh, uh, decisions that have been made so far. Um, and this is a painful process to go through. Uh, it's slow, but the advantage is that you have nice documentation of all the decisions that were made. And I'll, I'll show you an example in a second. Um, all right, so let me go back to the presentation. Um, all right, so. At this point, we were ready to start designing this application framework. And I guess I should say, like, what is an application framework? Um, that may not mean anything to anybody or may mean different things to everybody. But basically, um, it's a nice way of saying we want to build out a new UI and we want to make it configurable, extensible, and interoperable. That's basically the goal. Um, so application meaning a focus on the front end. Um, now, what does configuration mean? So files used to configure parameters and initial settings for some programs. Um, now, practically what this means is that 
uh, we have distributions all over the place. We need them to be um, able to set up their version of OpenMRS without coding. We'd like it to be so that they can set different properties. Say, I want this module, I want that module. Uh, on my login page, I want to show this image, I want to show this, or, or I want to have these colors for my organization. You need to give organizations flexibility to have some control over the, over the look and feel. Um, you want it to be extensible. So uh, extensibility, measurement of a, piece of, of a piece of technology's capacity to append additional elements and features to its existing structure. So basically, not everybody wants the same features in their EMR. Some people are just going to want things that are great for HIV, some for diabetes, um, et cetera. Um, so we have to find this balance because uh, it sounds so great to say, oh, you're going to make this system that's great for everybody because you can configure it and extend it and then anybody can do whatever they want with it. But the problem is, as, as you make things more generalizable and reusable, they're basically impossible to build and they're impossible to maintain and they're impossible to test. Um, so somewhere you have to say, uh, sorry, like this is an opinionated way of how we are going to do things. Um, and this is how everybody's going to have to do them. But you know, we're a collaboration and we want, we're an open source community. If we are too strict, then nobody will want to use what we build. Um, so um, I'm going to go over some of the kind of big decisions that we've made or really just two de big decisions that we made. Uh, I know this is a little bit of jar jargony right now, but I do think it's important for, for, for you to have some uh, understanding of kind of how we thought about this. Um, so d does any, how many people know what a single page application is? Okay, that's a good, good to know. All right, so um, the traditional uh, internet, you have a server, you have a client like a browser, um, you go to the page, it downloads some uh, HTML and then it displays it in your browser. Uh, when you wanna go to an another thing, say you're shopping in Amazon and you go to another products page, you have to go to a different web page, okay? And so each time you're going to another page, it's reloading. Um, it's not the best user experience. Um, uh, so what's come out over the past, uh, I guess, maybe 10 years ago now is these things called single page applications where basically you're in the same website, even though you're moving around to different pages. And there's a lot of, of, of uh, advantage, advantages about this that I, I won't go into, but you may not know it, but when you're in a, an application like Gmail and you're clicking on your, your, your viewing mail and you're going back and forth to different folders, you notice that the page isn't reloading every single time you do it. So it's a much faster and a much nicer experience for you as a user. Um, now compare that also to um, an app. So uh, each time you need a new version of the app, you have to download an app and um, uh, it's kind of a pain to get the newest version. Whereas with a, with a web page, because it's server based, as long as you go to the URL, you're going to get the newest version. So these are all big, um, big, big decisions that we made. And the traditional model for OpenMRS was server, uh, that, that old one, the server client version. And uh, asking people to migrate away from that is not a straightforward thing. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to migration at the end. Um, the other big decision that we made was fi uh, about fire. So um, we are taking a fire first approach. Um, now, fire is, you know, to use a Burke pun, it's it's hot right now. Everybody wants to use it. It, it everybody thinks that it's going to offer these great things. Um, and we're jumping on that bandwagon. Now they say that it's going to make things interoperable. I'm not as confident in that because on a semantic level, sometimes it's, uh, you know, it may, it, it may not give the semantic value that, that one would hope, um, uh, but it at least sets standards for how we're going to do things. Um, now, there are advantages for uh, us as OpenMRS. So um, for, first, we, we were using uh, uh, STU version three. So I, how many people are, famili are familiar with Fire? A lot more people there. Um, so Fire, one of the nice things about it is the, that it has this um, mat maturity model. Um, and so every two, two years or so, a new kind of version comes out. Um, so 
what's nice for us is that for OpenMRS, um, we don't necessarily have the resources to do a whole front end and model healthcare data and come up with our own terminology services. It would be better if we could um, delegate that to somebody else. And what I think is great about FHIR is that it comes up with representations for uh, a lot of the data models that we would like to have and now maybe don't have to think too much about what that data is going to look like. Um, so here's STU3. Um, I'm, I'm not showing you this to have you memorize all the different resources that are available. Um, but I just wanted to show you that in comparison with R4, maybe a little hard to appreciate, but basically not only do they mature different fire resources each cycle, but they're adding new ones. Um, and so you end up being able to do more and more complex things with fire, which is an, which is really like one of the coolest things that I think um, it, it provides. Um, now, um, does anybody here, have experience migrating to fire from from some other data model. Okay, so not not too many. So you know, it sounds great. We're going to take all of our data and make it fire. You know, set it on fire. Uh, and it actually turns out that it's really hard to move your data from whatever you were using before into a fire compliant API. Um, there's lots of technical decisions that end up having to be made, um, and the technical decisions often affect. The, the fire representation of the data that you're giving. So you're not even really assured of a one-to-one, -one, like this version that you're seeing in fire is actually the same thing that you would have been seeing in your old data model. So there's, there's trade-offs here. Um, in the short term, the position that OpenMRS is taking is that we'll continue to build out the existing data model resources using fire. Um, we don't know what we're doing in the long term. It would be nice to move to kind of pure fire-based um, servers, but uh, there's debate right now over what the next steps are. I uh, would love to hear thoughts of for those of you who have an interest and experience with this problem. All right, um, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the design part, which is, you know, less talky and a little bit more pretty to see. Um, so uh, Greg Schmidt, who was with me on my last presentation, um, is helping to lead the design efforts. So, you know, the more traditional model of software development, or maybe the older model, is that you just tell the developer, like, build something, like, here's kind of what I want it to look like, and, you know, you go figure it out and then come back and show it to me, and then I'll make suggestions, and then you do it again. And, you know, that way of doing software development is kind of, you know, it, 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 it leads to a lot of wasted uh, code and a lot of bad outcomes and takes forever to develop. And so more... Um, you know, I can't say how new this model is, but ideally you have a designer who will design out, uh, who will meet with your users, will design your um, screenshots for what you want your thing to look like, um, and then you'll build it with your developers um, sequentially. And uh, this is a hard thing to find. It's hard to find designers. It's hard to find good designers. It's hard to find healthcare designers. So we're lucky to have Greg working on this with us. Um, so just a few of the things that we've done so far. So uh, a style guide is basically a set of, um, for us, uh, high, only focused on CSS for basically what things are going to look like in the EMR. So... Uh, let me figure out how to get out of the screen. Well, All right, this is our style guide, so you can go check it out. Um, just a few of uh, things that you can see. So we have our colors, icons. Uh, we have more complex things like um, uh, I want to find the toast. There it is. All right, so things like toast um, and. This allows our both our designer and developer to kind of be talking the same language. Um, now, we use a, sorry, the way that the screen sharing between these things is not 
how I'm expecting it to be, so I apologize. Um, uh, the other tool that we use is called Figma. Um, so there's a bunch of design tools out there. You might have heard them, Balsamic, um, Sketch. They, they don't necessarily do the exact same things, but they're different um, kind of classes. Uh, and I want to show you the one that we use. So this is called Figma. It's a web app. Um, and it looks like Greg is actually working on it right now. Um, so you can see uh, his icon. So it's kind of cool. It's a real-time collaborative tool. Um, these are his mock-ups. So I'll just show you what he's been working on recently. Um, this is a patient, uh, basically the overview for the patient chart. Um, and over the course of the next few months, we'll be building out kind of a lot of the features that you might expect to see in a patient chart. So each one of these things Greg designs, Figma provides a way of sharing the CSS so you can see it on the right. And then it allows for a handoff to a developer to then build what you're seeing. Um, and you can see it's, it's a pretty big project. And this is just for a small feature, right? A small number of features. Um, so looks like right now he's working on the allergy feature. Um, now, the other thing that you should note is that not only are we doing this for um, a desktop, but we're actually doing this for a tablet and for a phone as well. So one web app that's responsive in all three settings. Now, there's not necessarily magic here. There's um, a lot of hard work that goes into making this possible, but we're thinking about all three. But from a user's perspective, you're going to the same website, whether you're on a phone, a tablet, or a, a desktop, and it should be responsive to, to your experience, which is, you know, something that you notice very quickly when you don't have it and you're trying to use a, a website on your phone. Um, all right, so those were just mock-ups right now that our dev team is still building, and I thought I would just finish with um, what we have so far. All right, so this is our login page. Believe it or not, a lot of work to actually just get something like this done. Um, okay, you always get worried when you're doing live demos. Um, so when you log in, this is all we have right now, just a search button um, uh, and a way of logging out. Um, you can search. Um, so I'll just, this is all just demo data. And then this is what our search screen looks like. You can see actually there's a bug that we need to fix. This card should be the same as the other ones. And then if you go to a patient's home uh, chart right now, this is all that you see, just, just their demographic detail. Um, so I think, you know, I want you to imprint this in your minds because the next time that I come back to present, what I'm hoping is to show you a much more fully featured um, EMR. Um, so, doing this somewhat blindly. Um, all right, so I, I know I'm running a bit over time. Thankfully, I'm the only person today. Uh, but I wanted to show you, kind of, this is the kind of stock reference application patient chart. Now, um, hold on one second. OK. Um, the thing is, everybody's using their own server-based EMR or their, their, their server-based version of OpenMRS. How do you get from, how are we going to get people to go from there to actually using this new version that we're coming out? Because as is often the case, you know, you build this great software, you think everybody's going to love it, and then everybody says, I'm happy with what I am. It's not worth the effort to shift from what I have to what you're offering me. Um, so, um, we're using something called a strangler pattern, okay? Now, in the kind of traditional model of software development, um, everything is in what we call a monolith. When you add new features, you put it all into the monolith. So this would be like the monolith, this, this thing here. And you wanna build a new feature, you gotta put it in there, we gotta do tons of testing because who knows if the code that Burke wrote is gonna work with the code that I wrote. Um, takes forever to deploy. And as your application gets bigger and bigger, nobody wants to release anymore because they're so scared of what's going to happen um, uh, when they do. Um, now, about, I don't know, 20 years ago, these things called microservices became in vogue. Show of hands, who knows what a microservice is? Okay. Um, so 
A microservice is a fancy way of just saying we're going to take these things out of the monolith and we're going to separate them and we're going to create different pathways for um, how to deploy them. Um, so th there's a historically microservices have been used on the back end. So a new kind of field has come up in the past few years called micro front ends, which is basically the same thing, but on the front end. So if you could imagine, come back to this screenshot, you could say like, all right, um, I, I don't want to use, so when, when the user clicks on diagnoses, rather than going to whatever screen the server has, we're going to link it to the new applications um, uh, version of diagnoses. And so you can go back and forth without causing any problems um, from a deployment perspective. Um, it's not the nicest experience, but it's a way of saying, all right, say you're an implementer of OpenMRS and you don't really care about my great patient chart, but you do need an appointment module. Um, I can now say, all right, load up our thing. You can just choose the appointment module. You can, this is how you link back and forth. And oh, by the way, because you're now using my appointment module, you get all these other things for free if you want to use them. And as you discover that the new things are better than yours, then hopefully you start to embrace them as well. Um, and that's called a, a strangler pattern. Um, all right, so I did the demo. So a few just challenges. I think I've kind of mentioned them throughout. So making decisions with lots of people remains uh, a difficult thing for us. Um, we're also trying to satisfy a huge community of users um, while still getting stuff done. So not, uh, not an easy thing. Um, the fire migration, very not straightforward. We, we also have to build out a lot of the fire API for the existing um, uh, data models that we have. Um, we also want to make this something that people will use in different countries. Um, it's not easy to get tons of users to provide feedback to us about whether they like it or not. Um, and I will say that we are learning, but the designer developer handoff is not easy. Um, designers love to hand things off and then be like, no, I, I, I can't handle this, you know, font being 12. It has to be 12.1. Uh, and then they have to go, I, I as kind of the product owner for this thing have to go and tell the developers, please, please don't get mad, but we want to make this change. And so trying to navigate building a great product with also building something is uh, oftentimes uh, a challenging thing. Um, all right, so moving forward. So as I said, I'll, I hope to be back in the, about, you know, four to six months to present you our next set of features. These are some of the things that we're, we're planning to have done by then. Um, there's a lot more that can be said about this. Um, and we're actually, hopefully I'll be able to report to you that we're, we have users. Um, I don't want to be up here again. I, maybe I won't come back until, uh, until we have users. Um, but we're aiming to deploy to at least two or three sites. Um, and then, you know, as this thing grows, I mean, the architecture is, I, I think, pretty solid. The, um, the dev X, you know, we like to just put X at the end of things now in tech. So the dev X, the developer experience is uh, pretty awesome for building on this. Um, and um, we're hoping to find uh, other people who, outside of kind of the traditional domains of OpenMRS to start using this. So um, I've already had a conversation with somebody at Brown who's been in the OpenMRS community, so I don't want to pretend like this came out of the blue, but he's, he has an informatics course with students and they're using a teaching EMR and this is a great opportunity to build out new features to do it in fire, um, to really use this to kind of hone the next generation of informatics students. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try and market this as a fire app playground. It'll be easier to, to play in than uh, Cerner or Epic, I'm sure. Um, and then we're still working out the details of this EMR design lab. Um, I think that there's probably not enough uh, effort on the research side on how to build good components within EMRs. And I think it's actually something that could take off within the right framework. And Regan Streif might be an excellent place to think about hosting this. Um, so I'll be back to discuss that in more detail in the future. Uh, so see you at the next web. JJ, um, I know we're a bit over time, but uh, since we don't have another speaker, maybe I'll take advantage. So, so great work and obviously very important what you all are doing. Um, 
the first challenge you put up there about difficulty making decisions um, seems to be pretty fundamental to all of this. So um, how are you balancing this, this tension of, of needing to sort of be able to make some pretty important decisions to move things along while, uh, you know, while balancing the needs of the larger community? What, yeah. what are you struggling with there? Um, so I think um, a few key things. One is that our technical lead, he, he really knows more than everybody else, probably everybody else combined. So we're just lucky to have somebody who can defend decisions very articulately and has a lot of experience to back it up and, and a lot of knowledge. So I would say I probably wouldn't be able to be very convincing without that person um, standing next to me. But um, we really have tried to do this in a public and transparent way. And then we set up a process for how many people we needed to make a decision. So when it comes to an RFC proposal, um, three members of the squad have to agree. Um, and then that's enough to approve the pull request um, for um, PRs of code, it just needs one approver. So we review, we're, we're trying to be very diligent in terms of reviewing the code. On the more macro level, you know, um, OpenMRS is decentralized. It does not have a decision-making um, structure set up. So what we've decided as a community is that um, we will support the formation of squads and support their decision-making processes as they decide them. Um, and essentially allow you to test out your ideas. As good ideas um, are demonstrated, then OpenMRS will start to publicize and embrace, and then ideally start moving resources towards supporting that squad's work. Um, and that's what we're starting to see right now. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to make. Um, I don't want to be uh, at all deceiving. Um, we don't have users, right? So we haven't convinced anybody that we made good decisions right now. Um, you know, we were strategic. We we took we took people from uh, very critical organizations within OpenMRS and said, you know, put a person on the squad and ensure that your interests are um, seen to, and you know, hopefully that will lead to uh, embracing this as we make something that's kind of an MVP. That's right. Yeah. 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 In fact, a lot of clinics have no connectivity. Um, and so, how do you build a web app in that setting? Um, so, that's something that we addressed um, kind of very from the beginning. Um, uh, without going into too much of the technical architecture, um, uh, basically there are now things called modules in, in JavaScript that are kind of an official standard. Um, and there's a developing standard um, that's called an import map um, that's built into the browsers right now. And so the import map will say define a name of a module and a location of where to get it from. Okay. And there's a tool, a library called System.js that you can use to import things from the import map. It is not a requirement that the import map be hosted in the cloud. It's an option. And, you know, for most of the uh, websites that we go to kind of when we're just surfing, that's what happens. But we've uh, uh, developed a uh, packaging tool that will basically bring everything into um, a Java module. So that gets served from the Java application that is OpenMRS. So it's a mix of JavaScript and, and Java. Um, but we are designing this to make it uh, usable for those clinics where there's uh, no, uh, no connectivity. If you're interested in the technical details, I'm more, more than happy to talk, that out, talk more about it later. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation, JJ. Uh, you know, it's exciting to see the next budding version. Um, but it's also, it strikes me as very ambitious. You know, you've you got a big agenda set out for you. Uh, and how you set up your software development framework isn't one of the smallest challenges in there. And so one of the things that, if we look at the history of software engineering, the number of software development frameworks ever developed, um, 
compared to the number who are actually, who survived and thrived, um, that's a very uh, small ratio. Yeah. Uh, so question is, you know, how, how can you stack your project for success there? You mentioned some of your peers, uh, you know, Jerry Douglas's uh, efforts and others, uh, so that you get this um, critical mass that you actually need to keep your framework surviving, not just your application. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't have a great answer. I mean, I think the, the fortunate thing about OpenMRS is that it's in all these places. And, and I mean, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I don't know if we've ever calculated the number of patients that it's used to take care of, but it's probably in, in the millions. Um, and nobody likes their version of OpenMRS right now. But the reality is, is that there's no alternative. I mean, from a migration standpoint alone, trying to figure out how to get what you have there in somewhere else is, is going to be a nightmare. Um, uh, so we're kind of, we have some time, we're starting to use up that time, but there's just not another open source EMR and, you know, for most of these places, they can't afford it. Now, I know that's kind of punting on your question, which is, you know, how are we going to get non-current users to maybe take this on? Um, and I, I don't have a solution for you right now. Uh, I mean, we are very well aware that we do not want to be writing code that nobody uses. Um, and we do have the ambition to make something greater than um, uh, kind of its current user base. Uh, so I turn to you all and I say, you know, are there places where there's opportunities to use something like OpenMRS. I mean, you know, in my in my dream world, in 10 years, we're building something that actually competes with some of the commercial EMRs um, that we have today. But how do we get there? I, I don't have a good answer. Next, next whip. I'm going to be prepared for that question. Um, <clears throat> I should preface that this is not an answer to that question. Um, but I wanted to uh, just throw out something that perhaps is a little comfort, and that is you're not alone in trying to migrate to fire services, but not sure how to, you know, leave the native APIs because there are certain other EHR companies with many more dollars that are also struggling with that balance of introducing new fire uh, service capabilities, but um, still holding on to a huge library of legacy APIs and web services. And, uh, and developers are asking that question of, hey, are, are you going to be pushing in this direction or this direction? And often the answer is, we're still figuring that out. Yeah. So yeah. you're not alone. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so it seems like you can leverage partnerships with uh, academic medical centers that have a school of medicine, and they also have a computer science department in the universities associated with it. Because a lot of the system development for healthcare, and if you get this computer science students doing projects on developing modules of OpenMRS, and you get the medical students training in OpenMRS that's free, and then it's going to pay for a pay for having a center. Right, just so they can train their students on it. Then you have an upcoming yeah. cadre of uh, computer scientists, programmers, and medical students who are all familiar with the existing system. Uh, and that seems to, that, that might generate a user base as well. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we turn to you guys. Uh, you know, why not? Why, why don't we have an informatics course at, uh, at IU or IUPUI that, uh, like, spends a semester designing and building a tool in an EMR and really like coming to understand that process. And even better if you can design and build something that ends up being used in a production environment. So. Uh, we have that course and Sabdashi um, teaches it. I think we're, we have a few more minutes if there are few, any more questions, but uh, any anything else? Hello. Uh, Thoughts? Um, hello? I, I did forget to say one thing that, um, so this is a kind of public pro pro project. So if you are interested in honing your programming skills, honing your design skills, that the Figma tool that I showed you, we can at least, you know, it, it costs money to edit, but we can at least give you access to be commenting on the designs as they're coming in. If you're just interested in saying, no, I, you know, I really want my vitals 
panel to look like this. Um, we would love to get people involved. It, it, it costs you nothing. Um, so if you are interested, you know, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. Anything else? All right. All right. Thanks, everyone.